Welcome, I'm Phil Howard, director of the Center for Media, Data, and Society, and this is our Media and Change series. It's a real pleasure to welcome Alison Powell from the London School of Economics. Welcome, welcome to Budapest. Hi, Phil, thank you very much for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to be here. Great. Um, well, this afternoon you're going to be talking about data, and there's an urban angle to what you're working on now, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Um, well, I've been thinking a lot about um, information rights and uh, access to information for a long time. And, and uh, recently I started thinking about um, access to data as an informational right. And the easiest way to talk about this is a kind of um, to use uh, this notion of access to information, especially access to the internet, using the milkshake model. And the milkshake model comes from Reddit, so I can't take any credit for it. But I'll, really br I'll briefly explain how it goes. The idea is that everything that's on the internet is like a collectively produced milkshake. Mm -hmm. So everybody has made this delicious milkshake, and the milkshake is free, except you need to get a straw mm -hmm. to drink it. So the internet service provider gives you a straw to access your milkshake. And we all know about how net neutrality operates, is that, and that's the idea, is that everybody can drink the milkshake. Everybody should straw. have a straw. You should yeah. have a straw. Right. And you know what happens with um, internet service providers who want to uh, control access to the information is that they essentially say, OK, I've sold you a straw, but now I'll just pinch it. Mm -hmm. So no, no more milkshake for you. Um, and what I've noticed recently is that this is a kind of access to information paradigm. And the, we have lots of concerns in relation to net neutrality about, you know, I've bought the straw already. How come you're pinching off the straw? Well, I want more money mm. from you mm -hmm. to, like, get if you want to actually sip that milkshake faster. What I've also noticed, though, and this is where it kind of connects with data, is that there's now another business model that's not just about selling you the straw. It's about having a straw that measures everything that you're drinking. Mm. And having the straw that measures everything that you're drinking, and then selling all the measurements back to the people who are making the milkshake. Mm -hmm. And this kind of model for datafying our access to information is really significant, and it's as significant an information policy issue mm -hmm. as things like the actual access to the information. If the cost of you going and getting access to the information that you want is that somebody else is going to be observing everything that you do, all of the information that you gather, um, and, uh, and analyzing that and representing essentially you and your life and selling it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. There could be many different kinds, including new kinds of chilling effects mm -hmm. around people's information seeking behavior. Mm -hmm. If I know that somebody is watching every time I access websites. Does that change the kinds of websites that I want to get access to? Mm -hmm. So I've started thinking about data as, um, as, a f as a communication policy issue, and this idea of the data traces that we create and leave as forms of media. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're even forms of media that don't have much content. Mm -hmm. Did you check in? Were you there? Mm -hmm. Right, your physical location. Your physical location, your mm -hmm. pattern of life. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a sort of um, subconscious set of, uh, of, of communication practices, mm. uh, which we didn't, haven't been thinking of as communication practices in the past. So we haven't thought about your location or your, your connections to particular people mm -hmm. uh, as being something that was part of our uh, communications environment. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you buy this metaphor, the, um, it, it makes the straw and the data media itself, of right? Whereas we used to think of media as being mostly a television, a radio, the newspaper, the newsprint, mm -hmm. and sometimes we refer to the media being a group of people, organizations, but you're actually talking about the infrastructure and the, the bits as media. The bits are media. Uh, the bits are the way that we get media, but now it's also the way that we express ourselves. And so I think our data about ourselves is also our own individual media. And this is mm -hmm. the sort of other side of the, of the data paradigm. So I was talking about the data paradigm in, in its sort of political economic terms. The way that, you know, um, access to information gets controlled through that sort of the idea of the straw. And now it gets controlled through the measurements taken of mm -hmm. what, you're, um, you know, what you're consuming online. That's one aspect to data. But the other aspect to, the, to data as media is the data that we create about our own lives and the way mm -hmm. that we think about um, or don't think about um, what we 
express about ourselves through mm -hmm. the data of our every that that of our everyday of practices. Everyday I, am, I'm really interested in this topic as well, and the thought of it as a, a shadow, because I think most people don't realize how much data they leave behind. This kind of shadow or silhouette of, as you said, their location, um, their media use patterns, all the metadata. Um, from surfing and increasingly for people who aren't online, right, they generate data too with their mm -hmm. credit cards and their financial transfers and all this stuff that uh, creates persona for us but we don't fully control. Yeah, it. I've been thinking about this as, ha there, as there being a distinction between mm -hmm. a data footprint, mm -hmm. which is the data <coughs> that you create about yourself, mm -hmm. and to a certain extent we have some control over that. Uh, we might have agreed that uh, that location data is going to be collected about us because that's valuable mm -hmm. for us in terms of other things that are going on in our lives, or because it makes our expression and our communication more precise. Mm -hmm. It's it's cool if I check in on Foursquare um, and you see that I'm there because I want you to know that I'm there, and you might turn mm -hmm. up and we might have a great time. Right. Uh, so that's one. That's the data footprint that I, that you make about yourself with your own data. And then there's the data shadow, mm. which is data about you that you don't make. Right. And the data shadow isn't really you, often because you haven't either agreed to um, or, or enacted uh, that data. Um, when you do a check-in, it's an action on your part. And a data shadow, as you said, is sort of all of the other things mm. that, are, um, that represent you that you don't necessarily have control over. Mm -hmm. um, and so the difference between your data footprint and your data shadow might be quite significant. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we can think of examples where our data shadows might not really be our own selves, mm -hmm. or they might misrepresent us. And this is right. where there are real political consequences to um, the existence of many people's data shadows and the construction of them by entities that aren't that person themselves. Right, because they get this data gets used by other groups. Mm -hmm. Or it gets it, it gets analyzed and manipulated, manipulated and presented in a way that is divergent from how a person right. might want to represent themselves. And it gets reverse engineered, right? So even pseudo anonymous data mm -hmm. gets pegged back. So one of the things that's interesting about your research is the way you can talk comparatively, and whether we whether we use the milkshake metaphor or shadow or footprint, there must be some really important differences between um, the way we produce data in North America versus the UK, or even the UK and Europe. So, Yeah, well, there are really big differences yeah. between these. And the political economic context is a big part of the um, difference between the data footprint and the data shadow. Uh, and also, uh, the political economic context creates different ways that data shadows get constructed. Uh, so one of the things that we learned from the Snowden leaks uh, mm -hmm. was about the UK government spy agency, the GCHQ, about the G GCHQ's data collection practices. Um, and the GCHQ has the most sophisticated and extensive data collection uh, um, mechanism of anywhere in the world. Mm. And it does a few things. It collects all um, communications data, uh, um, the content of all communications, and it collects metadata about communications. And the content of all communications is stored for three days, and the metadata about all communications is stored for 30 days. Um, but these things can be retroactive, these, these Im enormous uh, databases of information can be retroactively searched. Mm. So essentially, what this means in practice is that there is largely no private internet or mobile phone communication in the UK. Mm. And this data is also shared with other intelligence agencies around the world. And recently, Privacy International, who are an advocacy organization in the UK, just launched a campaign that um, is the result of, of, a, of, a, of a legal victory in a, in a secret tribunal which regulates these kinds of um, in, uh, data gathering activities. And their legal victory was related to the, um, I the sharing of, of information between GCHQ and the NSA in the, un in the United States. And what the tribunal found was that the, um, 
because there is so much information collected about, uh, about uh, communications in the UK, which includes, of course, all communications that originate or terminate in the UK. So mm -hmm. there's been uh, this program that, uh, that GCHQ ran, um, pulled data directly off the transatlantic cables as they landed in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, so this data was meant to stay in the UK. We, we, you could have a very large discussion about the legality of, of, uh, of, of collecting this level of, 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 uh, of information. And I can talk about that in a minute. But what I want to talk about here is sharing this back mm. to the NSA. So all of this data was collected by the UK's um, intelligence agencies, but then sent back to mm. the NSA. Mm -hmm. And this sharing back to the NSA of data about um, UK citizens was found to be illegal. So Privacy International's campaign is basically um, allowing you to see whether you were one of the people whose data was illegally shared back to the NSA. You can enter your email address and uh, they will go and look and see whether you were on the list of several million people whose data was illegally shared. Mm. And if, you, uh, if your data has been illegally shared, um, Privacy International will give you the chance to ask for that to be deleted. Mm. So. I mean, what this reveals is, is at such a scale that it's actually very difficult to figure out how to intervene. Mm. Uh, if essentially you don't have a pri private, the expectation of private communications, I mean, how, how do you operate mm -hmm. um, a liberal democracy? Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. raises some very, very interesting questions. And so th I think this, this uh, goes to our kind of shared interest in mm -hmm. the sort of politics of of data mm -hmm. as a form of media. As a form of media. I've noticed that with the colleagues in the UK I'm corresponding with by email that almost all of them now do encrypted or sh have a PGP key and have it embedded somewhere in the email in case you need to do this, um, have a direct encrypted conversation. Um, would you say that um, the technology use culture is adapting to this new knowledge of how much is captured? I mean, uh, are people getting better and more sophisticated about encryption? I would like to think so. Uh, the <coughs> fact remains that encryption tools are still difficult to operate, and I'm mm -hmm. sure you've received a PGP signed email from me. Mm -hmm. um, but did you also go back and then set up a, a matching PGP key on mm -hmm. your computer so that um, we can have encrypted communication? Mm -hmm. Did you? Um, I had one already. Okay, yeah. so do we now have secure communication? I think we could. Excellent, we could. very good. So yeah. you and I... But this I don't by default. But you don't by default. That's, and that's a good point. And you are only one of the many people I correspond with. And so this is one of the difficulties of, mm. um, of changing technological use cultures, is that it's perfectly fine for me to have a, um, a, a, a key embedded by default mm. in my email, but in order for this type of encryption to work, you also have to have a key. We have to establish a trust relationship, mm -hmm. and there have to be two of us. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a slow expansion of this. These tools don't operate easily by default. It did take me a good several hours to mm -hmm. set up my open source PGP signing right. by default on my um, email client. And many people don't want to take that kind the of time. time. Yeah. And Many people are not able to leverage the techni technical skills it still takes mm -hmm. to uh, enact these kinds of um, practices. But what I think is more significant is the possibility of doing th such things by default. Mm -hmm. um, because we know as scholars of, of digital media that, that the default makes a difference. Mm -hmm. That is how people's everyday practices change. Yep. change. So other things that have been happening in the UK are that the government has um, made a quite ridiculous request um, for access to um, communications for access to communications data and for the essential removal of encryption options by default. Uh, right. And this has been another uh, interesting political battle because this involves operators of services that many people use, mm -hmm. including services like WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So WhatsApp has uh, some encryption by default in the protocols that it uses to transfer information. And um, you know, recently the Prime Minister of the UK said, we don't want to have these kinds of encrypted communications. We would like to be able to observe everything. all everything. Mm -hmm. um, this then becomes a business problem mm. because you have a real disincentive for companies to innovate in a direction in which people are interested. Right. 
Uh, so whether or not it's a, business, it's a business problem, will it become an election issue in May? Do you think the public actually wants to talk about encryption? or I think the public wants to make sure that they can still use WhatsApp in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I think that people understand that one of the, one of the features of WhatsApp is that you know, nobody is spying on your data. Mm -hmm. um, so people may not want to have a very, very technical issue um, be discussed uh, in these election contexts. But people who enjoy using platforms that have certain um, features or affordances, mm -hmm. which might include um, encryption or protection of privacy would mm -hmm. like to continue using those services. Mm -hmm. I think one of the thing, one of the reasons I like studying the stuff we study is that um, is that people get excited and upset when their internet connections are threatened. So here in Hungary, the talk of an internet tax drives thousands of people into the streets, united on an issue you wouldn't think an intellectual property and sopa pipa and. So there is a chance that sometimes these encryption issues will really galvanize a public to oppose political elites and either toss them out of government or change things. And you've also written about SOPA, PIPA, and ACTA, right? Yeah, I wrote about SOPA and ACTA, and I wrote about um, the way that uh, mobilizations on the internet um, expanded beyond the internet. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I was really interested in in that piece was how the kinds of ideas about the internet being shut off or blacked out moved away from uh, people who were already very interested in the internet to people who maybe did not have an interest in the internet mm. except as a kind of essential service mm. or infrastructure that they would expect to function correctly. And to do this, I looked at how the SOPA blackout was talked about in the mainstream press. Mm and the way that this idea of the internet as being a kind of special space outside of normal everyday life carried forward this idea that it was something worth, worth protecting or worth worrying about. Worrying about um, yeah. And that that came up quite a lot in media coverage of things like the Wikipedia blackout, which mm -hmm. expanded then to become a meme about blacking out the internet or mm -hmm. shutting off the internet. And that meme sort of turned up and, and was reproduced and survived, in, and, and, survived yeah. and continues and in some ways um, crossed the Atlantic and continued um, as it was carried up by activists who were working on opposition to ACTA which was a very different kind of um, legislative proposal. It was a mm. treaty as opposed to a piece of um, domestic legislation. Mm. Uh, but this notion of the internet as a special space that should be protected and this risky idea of what happens when it blacks out mm -hmm. became very significant as well in the opposition to, mm -hmm. to um, that uh, proposal. One of the differences though, I think uh, in terms of the impact of SOPA and PIPA and ACTA is that Europe got a set of pirate parties, and pirate parties really galvanized, I think, around ACTA. North America didn't seem to get po a political party interested in intellectual property as an issue the way Europe did, right? Um, yes, because I think that the Americans had so many information activists who were working already. as information activists already. And um, and I did quite a lot of work in, the, in Canada and also in the U.S. before I came to the U.K. And one of the things I noticed when I came to Europe was that there were fewer um, professional information activists. Right. I think that's right. And Privacy International and is privacy one of And Privacy International is yeah. one of them, and the Open Rights Group, um, mm. which is the digital rights group in the U.K., um, La Quadrature du Net, mm. uh, which works across Europe, um, mm. And there are a few others, but there are not that many. Mm -hmm. um, and instead, you have a kind of broader politicization of mm -hmm. these issues, and you have a kind of embedding of information um, access issues, digital rights issues, and speech issues mm -hmm. into these um, kind of pirate parties. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the UK context, the election coming up in May, has the energy or public sophistication around tech internet access translated into public expectations for what GCHQ should be doing in the years ahead or what <sighs> we want our, or what the British voters want their politicians um, to do? I, I wish that this were the June? case. It's mm. the election is in May, mm. we're now in March, and this campaign, the campaign has been very muted, mm. um, partly because there is a real lack of trust in the political institutions in the UK at the moment. 
And there is also a collapse of the two-party system. Mm -hmm. And this is really eclipsing many other policy issues that you might mm -hmm. see. Um, because I'm sorry, a, a collapse of the coalition, you mean? No, a collapse of the two-party system. Ah, okay. um, and this is really politically significant mm -hmm. um, because for a long time, the UK has had essentially a two-party system with the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. And the Conservative Party has have had a very difficult time in their coalition government with the, li with the Liberal Democrats, who used to be a centrist mm -hmm. left party, and who have not ver played very well in this, in this coalition. Mm -hmm. They have advanced a few policy issues, but their public credibility is very low. Mm -hmm. So they're likely to lose almost all of their support. The Labour Party doesn't have a compelling leader. Mm -hmm. um, and their policies are not very easy to distinguish from the conservative pol from the conservative policies. Mm. Um, the policies are different. The framing is the same. So there is this sort of narrow debate on a on a very constrained set of issues, and at the same time there is a real lack of um, trust and credibility in these two main parties. Mm. The very close referendum vote in Scotland mm -hmm. recently has meant that the Scottish National Party is likely to completely um, eliminate the Labour Party um, from Scotland. And because Scotland, um, Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, Wales and England all compose the UK and all mm -hmm. vote in the UK elections, the main source of strength for the La Labour Party has been in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And so that is likely to go to the Scottish National Party. Um, the right of centre vote is being divided between the Conservatives and the UK Independence Party. Mm -hmm. The left of centre um, vote is the Liberal Democrat vote has essentially collapsed. The Labour Party has moved to the right mm -hmm. and we now have the Green Party as a potential um, left of centre party mm -hmm. but with only 16 candidates running. So they're, unlike they're likely to get quite a lot of votes but they're unlikely to have much Many representation seats. in Parliament. Yeah, right. So what is, what is more likely to happen is a minority government um, mm -hmm. a in coalition between a number of parties beyond mm -hmm. the two parties that have traditionally governed. So this mm -hmm. is what is attracting attention. Mm -hmm. It makes it very difficult for people to engage with policy issues because mm -hmm. the election is about the parties. It's not right. about the policies. The policies. Uh, I, I think I, I get that analysis of how the parties m may fare in the election. It still seems to me that um, ISIS use of social media is dominating the UK news and that the major politicians to who, who, sp who speak or think on national security issues still largely defending GCHQ and the role of the government in being able to access everything it needs to access. Right? Yeah, is this is the security <coughs> discourse. And right. we definitely see the security discourse pr triumphing over the privacy mm -hmm. discourse. Mm -hmm. You don't have much of an access to information discourse, which you might have in the United States, where there is stronger um, co constitutional protection Protections. for speech. Right. We don't have a written constitution in the UK. Uh, there are common law precedents for the right to speak, mm -hmm. um, but they are differently structured yeah. than, in the, than in North America. And so as a result, you do have this kind of security discourse triumphing mm -hmm. um, at the moment. And the threat of terrorism um, becomes a reason to continue with surveillance practices. There's also been quite a lot of l sort of legal um, wrangling over the definition of, um, the r of the separation of responsibilities and the definition of appropriate surveillance. Appropriate surveillance, right. And so this, uh, I am s I'm slightly stepping outside of my area of expertise, but I have just been speaking to a colleague in the law department at the LSE about, about trying to understand exactly how this operates. Mm -hmm. And it is extremely unclear the, re the relationships between the government and the intelligence agency are themselves not clear. Mm. And, uh, and so the, it is under the current law, the surveillance is lawful. Whether the law applies to the surveillance that has been undertaken to the extent that it has been undertaken is in question. Is in question, I see. And so this means that a very clear discourse of we mm. must continue to monitor communications to prevent terrorism and to prevent things like teenage girls disappearing mm -hmm. to Syria, which has been a very big media um, story in the last couple of weeks in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, 
tends to get more attention than we are. Would re it would, it's very important to protect access to information because that story becomes really complex because right. there's not a clear narrative and there's not even clear responsibility for how that can happen. Hmm. Uh, so I don't mean to sound like this is a di sort of dire situation, but there, but uh, my sense is that it is h it is hard at the moment to undertake. Um, this is a policy issue. This is a policy issue. Y you and I spoke earlier about te um, cultures of technology use, uh, and I've heard people say that the UK has sort of its own culture of surveillance. That people in the UK may just be used to cameras, uh, and uh, there's this survey data about how the average person is doesn't mind being caught on a surveillance camera as long as they don't know it's there. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that the, um, the public in the UK actually isn't that worried about surveillance uh, and that it's a few privacy activists or that these are surveillance norms from North America that we're projecting in the UK? I think maybe it's not a public I think issue. largely that this is this is the case and this makes it more difficult perhaps to advance the kind of questions that we've been talking about about mm -hmm. Um, access to information, about access to um, expression, and about freedom of expression, um, because there is a strong surveillance culture in the UK, and it's part. It has it, since the rollout of the C of CCTV, uh, mm. large scale CCTV, in the thirty years ago. Thirty years, years ago, years ago. Yeah. It, it's been you know incrementally increasing, such that which I think was also a response to the IRA. Yes, part, it was. Right, so it was also a response to a national yeah. security. Yeah. And I think, and there is a really, uh, there's a cultural value in protecting national security mm -hmm. as well. And so mm -hmm. that is very important and that's part of the culture. And of course, I am not originally from the UK, so some of this I view mm -hmm. slightly, you know, ethnographically from the outside. And I find it fascinating that there is um, such uh, acquiescence mm -hmm. to surveillance. Um, and it makes me ask questions like, what kind of culture is produced when everybody assumes that they are surveilled at all times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what kinds of um, expressivity emerge from that which are different than those that emerge from a culture which resists surveillance. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of hiding in plain sight, you get a lot of performance, you get a lot of steganography, mm -hmm. you know, you mm -hmm. get a lot of uh, uh, the culture, there's a lot of um, dressing up in the mm. in the UK culture. There's a lot of masquerade, mm. uh, which is, has very deep and long as a, roots. As a protest perform uh, as performer? A, as a, as a sort of um, part of, of everyday cultural practice. Mm. Uh, in North America, people celebrate Halloween once a year. Mm. In the UK, people dress up in costumes a lot. Mm. So these are some other things that I think of as being different kind of cultural responses, right. perhaps, to cultures where surveillance is more prevalent. More prevalent. So maybe it is not yeah. important. Maybe the, co the concern is not with whether you are being watched, but with whether anybody actually knows what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Maybe people think really quite radical things, but enact different sorts of things. So I do think there are mm -hmm. different kinds of cultural responses. Mm -hmm. And perhaps are advocating only against surveillance is not the way to develop, in this context, a culture of free expression. Maybe mm -hmm. you also want to develop uh, the notion of um, what I think of, of what uh, Dana Boyd calls social steganography, or mm. I've been thinking about as vernacular cryptography. Mm. How, do we, mm. how do we construct the things that we want to communicate without mm. them being observed? Mm -hmm. And they could be, um, for example, in, uh, in social media in China, mm. uh, using elaborate visual puns Meta to refer, and, and yeah. uh, or visual metaphors to refer to, uh, to concepts or historical mm. events that, I that um, otherwise would be uh, censored from mention, mm -hmm. like ref references to Tiananmen Square being uh, constructed in, um, through references to tables mm. because they have six seats and four legs. Four legs, <laughs> that's right. Um, it also seems to me that this um, it's possible to imagine some public organization helping shape this culture of surveillance. And uh, of the countries that you study, uh, Canada has a privacy s commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S., which may have a culture of resisting surveillance, actually doesn't have a privacy commissioner. The U.K. does have a privacy commissioner. Um, is that office... Uh, 
effectively engaging, you think, on some of these surveillance issues? Or does making, it a na does making surveillance a national security concern sort of take it out of the realm of something that a privacy commissioner could help with? Um, the and I'm not, I, I don't know specifically what the mandate of the UK Privacy Commissioner is, um, but my sense is that surveillance and privacy are conceived of differently. Hmm. So surveillance is something that, you know, we're, that, that, that uh, is of collective value because it prevents poor behavior, mm -hmm. um, whereas privacy is something that an individual can claim. So well there is this claims, kind of tension right. between um, a, a sort of social norm mm -hmm. of protection from harm mm -hmm. and an individual right of privacy. Right. And this is one of the reasons why I think in some ways the, the, con the concepts of privacy that we have been working with are maybe less suited for the kind of information mm -hmm. environment that we are working in. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is, th is this expansion of, 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 the, of the role of data as a mm -hmm. form of media that we were just talking about. And I just recently was on a panel at the Royal Society um, in London where we were talking about the future of privacy. And I was specifically talking about the future of privacy in relation to the Internet of Things. Mm. Um, and the Internet of Things, as you know, is, is are sort of sets of technologies that are sensing and connected. Mm -hmm. And I think these are also, in some ways, media technologies because they are producing those data shadows and possibly also producing those data footprints. And they raise really interesting questions for notions about privacy. Mm. So where do you place the, do you place a boundary, which is the sort of modern sense of privacy, this is mine? Or do you have to have a kind of concept of privacy that is about the relationships that the kinds of information you produce about yourself or that is produced about you about by you? sensors right. Right. or other kinds of entities? And, those then, and do you have to then think about the relationships that all of those data have to each other mm. outside of maybe th the boundary of your individual? Mm. Fascinating. And it's a difficult set of questions, right, to answer in the near term. I wonder if any particular election will get us a better privacy regime that we might, might actually help us enjoy the Internet. That well, I we think the, 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 the kind of countervailing tendency to the surveillance tendency is that people really enjoy the internet. The mm -hmm. internet has become infrastructural in mm -hmm. many, many countries in the world. And so these domestic um, political cultures and these domestic um, technical cultures as well, as you said, uh, um, in some ways struggle against mm -hmm. this, this sort of global promise mm -hmm. of, of greater access to information. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, I, and I can see this really clearly in the, um, the response to, to um, David Cameron's announcement that he would like to have access to all the communications data. I mean, the, the initial response was, well, that's totally impossible. Mm -hmm. Because if you try and you know, constrain in one area, something else will just emerge somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that's the nature of a networked communication network, right. platform. And that's likely to become more extensive as we see the expansion of the internet away from um, only you know, computing devices to all kinds of devices. Mm -hmm. Our communication environment is gonna become more pervasive. To explore, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much it for was today's a pleasure. conversation. All right. My guest today has been Alison Powell from the London School of Economics. Thank you. Thanks.